The Man in Line with Beth Espy. Best of my good afternoon. It is Beth in for Andy just for today. Lovely to have your company. And for the next hour, it is over to you. Whatever is on your mind, 66 13 68, that's the number to call. It'd be great to have a chat on air, but you can text 166 177 or email studio at manxradio.com. A lot been going on this week. We've been hearing from the Infrastructure Minister about the Isle of Man ferry terminal in Liverpool. Any thoughts on that? Police warning of more arrests to come in the fight against drugs coming to the Isle of Man and mounting evidence that businesses on the island are facing a really challenging time. If you are a small business owner, it would be great to talk to you. Or perhaps there's something else completely on your mind. Whatever it is, I'm here till one, so it would be great to talk to you. Some of the texts and uh, emails that we've had in so far. Now, just with regard to the ferry terminal, and we'll hear a little bit more about that because we had the Infrastructure Minister live on breakfast this morning. But Baz has been in touch to say, is government investigating the possibility of leasing out use of the terminal at Liverpool Dock to other ferry operators? Well, Baz, I've asked that question and hopefully we'll have an answer to that for you as soon as we can. Uh, With regard to drugs, the drug fight is something they will never win and they know it. It's a waste of money and time to look at the success Portugal has had with the decriminalisation of drugs. And Terry Nobin has been in touch. Not sure if Andy read this out yesterday, but just in case he didn't. First of all, still no bin from Douglas Corporation. That sounds like it's been going on for a while, Terry. He also says, don't let the government take away our small change. That would be another nail in the coffin for cash. The more we do online, says Terry, the more scammers will be in charge of our money. And he also has a thought about e-scooters. He says, if e-scooters will not be allowed on the pavements, why are bikes? And he also believes helmets should be at least mandatory for anyone under the age of 18 on both scooters and bikes. Well, let's uh, talk a little bit more about the ferry terminal in Liverpool. Uh, Birthing trials there will not now start, we know, until early 2024. The £70 million facility is expected to receive its first passengers at the end of March next year. Meanwhile, the company's new flagship Maxman will begin birthing trials at the Liverpool facility later in 2024, prior to the start of the winter weekend sailing schedule. Simon Richardson has more details. Passenger facilities and land-based work are set to be completed this summer. However, external Finally, the marine works continue to present challenges in a testing environment and are expected to continue until autumn. The pace has picked up recently, though, due to better weather, and more than 70% of the scour protection has now been installed. It's envisaged that staff training will get underway in January next year. That's Simon Richardson. Well, as I mentioned, the Infrastructure Minister, Chris Thomas, joined Sean and Christie on breakfast this morning to give his view on what this all means for the project. The Manxman is a year-round vessel that goes primarily to um, Haysham, and then it will also do these winter sailings to Liverpool. Um, the last couple of years, we haven't had winter sailings to Liverpool. We've had uh, sort of coaching arrangements from um, Haysham instead. Um, basically, the terminal is going to be completed in the autumn um, in terms of the marine works. And they're, they're, we've had some good news in the last few weeks. And the completion date is uh, goes backwards and forwards all the time as it has to do un- inside one of these NEC um, target completion date, target cost, activity schedule, pay and gain share based contracts. We've had good news. The marine works are going better, as we hope they would now. The uh, now better weather's here with the summer, and uh, essentially we've had to make practical arrangements with the steam packet staff. Have got to be recruited. Trials have got to take place, and we wanted to provide uh, certainty rather than uh, ambiguity and uh, an answer and uh, uncertainty about when and which boats would use which facilities when in the next 12 months. So am I disappointed or or pleased? Well, I'm pleased that we can begin to provide certainty. I'm disappointed that this project has been more difficult than any of you could ever have imagined, I think. You were able to give us an update on the expected uh, total cost for this terminal. So this contract is what's called a pain gain share NEC contract based on an activity schedule. And 
what that means is we always have a target cost and a target completion date, but um, and we and, 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 and parties give early warning of uh, of, um, of, of of issues and, and challenges that need to be addressed, and then compensation events can be claimed. So we can't give you a final cost, but what I can assure the Manx public is is that Timwood approvals. Treasury concurrence, financial regulations, they're absolutely paramount for the, the team from Treasury, DOI, Steam Packet that actually um, oversees the private sector project manager that's managing this project on our behalf. And afterwards is a time for looking back on things. Now the focus needs to be completing the, um, the terminal and getting the excellent new vessel that the Steam Packet's going, providing winter schedule next winter and um, sailing through the sailing you know when the steam packet announces to Haitian before that and making sure that um, we we can actually um, understand what we need to understand about the last four or five years for this project and perhaps even the Manxman project and all other projects we've got a new system in place already called a, a major projects board and two of the three of the things I announced in my budget speech that we've um, learned already are that there's always an optimism bias which needs to be addressed at the early stages firstly secondly we need a staged approach to financing projects like this not a, a one-off financing and thirdly we need to recognize that over four or five years especially in a period when we have COVID and the war in Ukraine, we're going to have cost inflation, and that's got to be dealt with in a in a in a, in a upfront rather than through um, the course of a project. That is the Infrastructure Minister Chris Thomas, who was speaking live on breakfast this morning about the ferry terminal. You've had lots of thoughts on this. Marie's been in touch to say Chris Thomas is just like the rest, spinning a yarn and avoiding the issues and problems. As for Tim Glover, who was a member of DOI, he has resigned, says Marie, because he knows there's a lot more flack coming his way with regards to the airport. G says at the start, Mr Thomas said there was some good news, but then he simply gave the 2024 dates. Where was the good news? There was also so says G, little reassurance about the cost. How many more millions is the ferry terminal in Liverpool going to cost is another text here. And is there anything the government touches that actually gets completed on time, on budget, and what we get is what we were promised in the first place? It is embarrassing. What do you think then? Um, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Have you seen the photographs of the Manxman? Um, there's a text here from somebody um, ending 505 that says, I've just had a look at the new pictures of the Manxman. They forgot to show the cattle seating. They showed the executive lounges and the sleeping pods, but not the, for the general users. Can they please show the rest of the boat? Also, how much to sleep, use the sleep pods per sailing and uh, how much for the bedrooms, the cabins as well. Now, here's one from Tony, who says, does anyone have any concerns regarding the exponential growth of intelligence with artificial intelligence? This, says Tony, could be very serious because AI isn't about making machines more human-like, but to make humans more machine-like. This seems more obvious by the day. Um, there was a story this morning, actually. It was the boss of the energy company, um, I think it was Octopus, was it, in the UK. They warned that artificial intelligence will hit workplaces like a freight train. Yesterday, BT in the UK announced it'll lose around 40% of its workforce by the end of the decade, with AI replacing thousands of jobs. The CEO of Octopus Energy says the technology will ultimately improve many industries and create new roles, but Greg Jackson fears the pace of its development could mean some jobs are at risk in the short term. Um, and I think I'm right in saying that uh, a lot of the jobs that have been taken over by AI, certainly with some of these firms in the UK, is replacing Applying to emails. I don't know, Howard Kane is here. Do you think you could be replaced by AI? Uh, that's a very good... Yeah, probably, yes. Very easily, come to think of it, yeah. It's yeah, an interesting easily. one, isn't it? Because, you know, if you think if, you, if it's doing those mundane jobs and replying to emails and getting those basic things, that that's fine. But when you're thinking about people losing their jobs and also people losing that very notion, which we have done in recent years, of face-to-face -face contact, it's a difficult one. Yeah, uh, I think... The bottom line is technology always changes the, the marketplace, doesn't it, and how the how we actually live and how we work. And I think people are always very scared about new technology coming in. I know I always am, uh, not least because of jobs, but you just think you don't know what's going to happen. There's this sort of fear that it might dominate the entire world. I don't think that's going to happen in our lifetimes. But there's no doubt that, yeah, you could see that a lot of jobs are going to go in various places. So 
I think it's going to be a sucker and see. Just very quickly, I was listening to the radio last night and there was one person who was saying, you know what, I love this AI. He was severely dyslexic. He ran AI on things and he said it's changed my life because I can get my, basically can get my PC now running some of this chat GBT things and uh, GPT and it, it will basically make his bad English into good English. Well, that's the other side to it. Well, AI cannot answer the phones, which Howard is going to do now. Lovely to talk to you on air. 66 13 68 is the number to call. Be great to have a chat. Paul says, artificial intelligence, oh, Paul, has been here for years. You'll find them in the House of Keys. Awful. Uh, Fran says, how daft is this government? Who on earth would spend £70 million to make it a five-star ferry terminal just uh, so many people can have luxury before bringing misery and crime to our island? It's as good as saying welcome to the Isle of Man. Uh, those who want to bring crime over here are welcome. TJ says, new vessel sailings. Can we talk a little bit more about how people who've been injured with vaccines, so this is uh, TJ's point of view here, have had their plight suppressed, excess uh, death rates are growing without any real cause, heart problems going through the roof, and uh, TJ believes there is a common link. Let's go to the lines. Howard is on line one. Good afternoon, Howard. Hello, Beth. Caught me by surprise there when Howard said it was Beth. Oops. Uh, very nice too. Well done. Um, oh. The you're going to get a lot of them, I suppose. The Liverpool London stage. The yes. Um, Everton. There was a thing on Everton Stadium how it was progressing well and everything was doing. And I said last year sometime that that stadium had finished in unused use before the first car goes down the ramp on the Liverpool London stage. But when you come back home and you look at the farce that this is. Somebody should be sacked uh, in government, and whoever the consultants were should be held responsible. Uh, This is public money, and public money means our money, and they're wasting it hand over fist. Um, If the Victorians had the same principle, the same ideas, a lot of the stuff that we're trying to preserve now would never exist. The likes of the Snaefell Railway, in dreadful conditions and... uh, all sorts of equipment that they had in those days. They built that in six months. They can't build a landing stage in uh, Liverpool, and what is it now, three years nearly? Uh, They're always finding excuses, and now we've got March, so we've got a whole winter, uh, and a a whole summer and a winter. It's virtually a year before you're going to get another excuse that something else has gone wrong. And as I say, somebody within the hierarchy of government, there were some bailed out of the DOI, Uh, They must have known what was coming. And it's time that somebody was emptied because they are obviously not up to their job and our backs being protected. I suppose, Howard, I mean, if to play devil's advocate, uh, you know, if if we hold people to account for this kind of thing all the time, are we going to get to the point where nobody will ever take a risk on anything? I mean, I understand, I do understand what you're saying, but if we look at the world situation over the past few years, there is a lot that could be blamed on the escalating costs with this, I guess. Well, not talking about the escalating costs. Time. Uh, the escalating costs um, are a disaster on their own right. But the time factor, um, somebody said on their programme there not so very long ago that the Laxy wheel is incomplete. Uh, that's not been finished. The promenade's not been finished. The lighting system on the golf course, Douglas Town Council, not been finished. Now, who's looking after all these? Because, again, it is public money. The government don't have any money of theirs. They borrow our money. And um, they use it, supposedly, allegedly, to the best of their ability, and they're not. It's another disgrace. Um, so, heads should roll on this one. Because you can't put that off for another 10 months. Uh, They kept doing that, and you know that big hospital that was in Liverpool getting built by the firm Carillion. And they now have um, fingers in pies all over the place, and it's costing millions of pounds up in Scotland uh, to repair the, uh, the damp that's coming into houses up there. And this was by a subsidiary of Carillion. So who is doing the job? Who is the main contractor? You've never heard this. Uh, It's a question that should be asked. Who is the main contractor? Who are the consultants? And who is responsible? And is there a bond? Has there been a bond posted? And if so, has that been taken off them? All right, Howard. These are the questions that should be asked by the 
the people in Parliament, in government here on the island, because that's what we pay them for. OK. Thank you very much as ever. Lovely to talk to you. Okay. Take care. Bye Have now. a good weekend. That's uh, Howard there. Uh, now to line two, and we can join Peter Murcock. Good afternoon, Peter. Oh, hello, Beth. How did you know it was me? <laughs> I'm psychic. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't. I didn't even leave my name this morning. Uh, yes, about the bishop. Oh, yes. Having a, a role in Timwald. Yes. It's an old chestnut. It's cropped up several times. So I've been on the island 33 years now. And I've heard this one come up to, uh, more than once. I think the first point I would make is I think it's very discourteous to be bringing it up at all. And I'll tell you why. And I'm not putting a point for the Church of England because I don't actually go to the Church of England. The bishop gives his services absolutely free. He does not take any payment whatsoever in the ledger code. He's the only one who's like that. He is also, if you think about it, the only independently appointed person in the LegCo. No, no, no one else in the LegCo is elected. They are selected by the House of Keys. Now, I understand that the argument that's being used is making the place more democratic. Well, if they want to do that, I would suggest that their starting point is to make the LegCo democratic, because it's not at the moment. It's all in the hands of the Keys, and it stands to sense that the Keys, because they appoint the people, which I believe is totally wrong anyway, they're going to obviously appoint people who are people after their own heart. I mean, I would be very, very surprised, say, for example, if somebody like myself, if I put my name forward, which I wouldn't do because I think it's undemocratic, but suppose I did, I'd be awfully surprised if I got the majority votes to put in LegCo. But I suppose, Peter, if I can just um, interrupt there, the, yeah. the point is, is that there is a degree of say, I suppose, to the other people who become members of the Legislative Council, but with regards to the position of bishop, that is not decided by anybody who has got any say in Parliament. So that, I think, is, is one of the arguments that that uh, person is just that person, irrespective of, of who they are. I think that's, I don't think that really is very good argument. When you put it against the, uh, I think, I come back to the point, I think the whole essence of it is extremely discourteous because he does not get paid and he also helps to remind the uh, legislature of the fact that they, by their own decision, acknowledge the Isle of Man as having a Christian basis, and to which I refer to a debate that took place on January the 22nd, 2003, on the national anthem of the Isle of Man. That's what they said it had got to be called, and so I call it. Not one person disagreed with the national anthem of the Isle of Man, which is probably the most Christian national anthem in the world. They also expect to have the Tinnel Day ceremony, which will be uh, uh, taken, uh, overseen as far as the service goes by the bishop. Now, I take it that if they're wanting to uh, remove the post of bishop, that then in the future they'll cut out all the ceremonial which the Anglican Church offers them, and they'll just simply jump out of their cars and run up the hill and promulgate the laws. You paint and, a great picture yeah. there, Peter. Well, uh, that's, well that's, uh, that, that's the logical conclusion. I mean, why should the Church of England um, offer them its services just for the convenience if there isn't a sort of a reciprocal attitude? So it's not as simple as that. And I think that um, if they want to take some steps at all, I would be very, very supportive of getting the whole of the Legislative Council elected by the people rather than the present uh, very undemocratic system. When they've once done that, if they then want to consider whether this unpaid member is such a hindrance to democracy, because after all, he can't, he's one vote and he's not going to be out, able to outvote anybody then they might, I suppose, uh, turn to that one. But I think they've got plenty to do 
uh, before they even start talking about the bishop's place. So I hope all the people will give that some careful consideration and will be grateful to the bishop for the fact that he offers free of charge uh, wisdom to the country and he does it in accordance with the stated wishes of the legislature when they adopted um, O Land of Our Birth as the national anthem of the Isle of Man. That's my contention for today, Beth. Good Lovely. To you. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, okay. I'll just say very quickly, because we do have to move on, we have got yes, other please. callers, but I would just say, yeah. surely, though, is it not healthy to, to debate this at this point? And if people feel the same way as you, then they can pass that on to their representatives. This has, would have to go through Tim or to be voted on. The thing I do think is, um, I don't argue about people can debate upon anything. I do think that our present House of Keys is absolutely full of difficult problems that they've got to face. And I think that they've got plenty to do at the moment without starting on this one, which ought to be really bottom of their list. All right, Peter. Thank you very much indeed. Lovely to talk to you. Thank you. Uh, Peter Murcott there speaking about the bishop. Let's go to line one. We can join Bonzo. Good afternoon, Bonzo. Ah, oh, good afternoon, Beth. Ja Pastor Farai and the uh, the blessings of the flying, flying spaghetti monster. Thank you. Uh, be upon you. Yes, yes, uh, yes. May his may his newly appendages bless you. <laughs> um, but that's but that's not what I'm, I'm not what I'm here to talk about. I can talk about Pastor Farianism at great length at another time. But uh, what I'm talking about today is artificial intelligence. Okay. And the huge. Uh, now, I and others have been talking about this for several years now, um, you know, that we've been seeing this coming down the tracks. And now with you know, cost of living, wage inflation, etc., you know, it's reached that, um, that push point where companies are now going, right, fine, the cost of the system you know, outweighs the cost of paying people to do things mm. and is more efficient, right, fine, so we'll implement it. And they're going for it. Gangsters. When you're talking about people like BT, who are you know, planning to get rid of what, about 50% of the workforce by the end of the decade, uh, and other people like Vodafone, and well, um, a few years ago, uh, I think it was a, a Japanese um, you know, finance uh, company um, who actually automated their processes, taking out a, a, a large layer of you know, quite skilled and well-paid people. Mm. Um, and getting better results for it. Um, now, we then come, of course, to the Isle of Man, which, of course, has the kind of jobs which are readily replaced by AI. And that, if it goes through in the same way as with the plans that the BT have and Vodafone and other people, then it is going to hollow out employment on the island, and it's going to hollow out empl- well-paid um, and you know, relatively skilled employment, uh, and the effect that that's going to have on the tax base and such is going to be marked. It's, it, we're going to have to think about a new way of orientating the economy in order to cope with that, rather than AI just being something that creates a huge raft of, of unemployment and uh, thousands of people leaving the island. It's an interesting one, isn't it, Bonzo? I mean, and as Howard was saying, you can see the benefits of AI for for some people, um, but there is this fear, isn't there, with the with the idea of, of robots taking over the world? And you wonder whether this happened, I don't know, two hundred odd years ago, when you saw machinery taking over some of the jobs that people were doing. Were they having similar sort of conversations? Oh, absolutely. Well, Luddites were were busy in this smashing machinery and such like that was you know, taking the weavers' jobs and such. Um, so, yeah, there's always been that kind of uh, reaction. And then it comes to sort of equilibrium and new jobs get created so that pe- people's old jobs are kind of replaced. Mm. Uh, and technology helps doing that. Well, that, well, that's fine. But the problem with AI is that it doesn't create more jobs to replace the ones that it, that it takes. Okay. And so you have to think of a way of making... The, uh, you know, the economic benefit that AI produces um, to be included in, in the economy so that people benefit from it. And that's where we get to the idea of something like universal basic income. And that is something I think that the Isle of Man 
really ought to start thinking and planning for now. All right, Bonzo, I'm going to make you that. Uh, that's your task for the weekend. Lovely to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Uh, that was Bonzo there talking AI. So if you've got any thoughts on that, 66 13 68 is the number to call. We can join David now on line three. Good afternoon, David. Hi, Beth. Just want to talk about the bishop and, and the role there that he has within the, the parliamentary setting. OK. We've had this discussion probably about a couple of years ago, I think it was, when they wanted to t- try and remove things. Yeah, it was 2017, I, I think, if, yeah. Yeah, if they want to open a Pandora's box... Like um, some people were saying yesterday, and it was a lady who was uh, more mature than me, I think, uh, and that said, well, if we're going to look at that, why don't we look at the role of the um, Legislative Council and say, is it, it's not publicly elected. It's uh, done by their peers within the, the House of Keys. So therefore, this is a similar situation. Mr. Murcott's come on, which I, I, I applaud that guy, coming on and giving us a different royal side of it. The bishop doesn't get paid. The only thing I have against the current bishop is he's a Liverpool supporter, <laughs> but I can't... Can't hold, hold that. that against him. Totally against him, but uh, <laughs> they, there you go. But I just wonder whether it's an opportunity. If they want to open the box, they don't want prayers. Uh, like Mr Mercant said, you go to the ceremony, which is more or less religious at uh, on Timmel Day. Uh, whether we should just change things or, or, uh, and move things along totally and just say you have a parliamentary uh, session within Timbald and all the acts are po- promulgated uh, instead of going to the Hill. And my other uh, issue is too, when it's the 5th of July, that's our national day, it's not the 3rd, the 4th or the 6th. And I'll leave it at that. All right, David. Lovely to talk to you. Take care. Uh, That was David. Some thoughts about uh, the bishop there. Um, There's an interesting one here from James who says, one compromise on the bishop situation would be to allow him to be a member of Timwell to speak on motions and debates, but remove his right to vote, just like the Attorney General. Um, That is uh, one thought. And Roger says, my favourite thing. Thanks, Roger. Nearly. It is Beth just sitting in for Andy today. 12.35, lovely to have your company. 66 13 68, that's the number if you'd like to have a quick chat about anything at all on air between now and one. You can also text 166 177, email us studio at manxradio.com or you can find us on WhatsApp as well, 07624 166 177. Mike has messaged us on WhatsApp to say, I've seen these scooters, talking about e-scooters, in both Brisbane and Bristol. They're just abandoned everywhere after a weekend night. I've seen a few people sustain injuries and they both scare you and drive you mad on pavements and pedestrian areas, whether they are allowed there or not. In theory, says Mike, they are a great idea, but the usual ones ruin it for all. Uh, Mark says, I'm hoping that with all the recent financial costs in government, they won't be able to afford to spend another £2 million putting fluoride in our water that is not needed. Uh, Mary in Ramsey says, I'd like to know who did the negotiations with Liverpool regarding the years left on our lease on the existing landing dock. Surely this would have been very valuable and the cost of the new landing dock could have been shared between Peel Holdings and the Isle of Man government, but this is never mentioned. And Andy says, with regards to the role of the bishop in LegCo, it's wasting valuable time when food bank, housing crisis, etc. are more of a priority. Is there a hidden woke agenda, says Andy, being pursued by those who want the Bishop out. Uh, some other text, Howard? As usual, oh, that's better. Look, it sounded like Davros last time from the Daleks, didn't I? Um, a usual mix of things. A nice little one here. I didn't uh, hear you read it before from G saying uh, on a totally separate topic, as is often the case on the Manor 9, Defa plant woodland trees. Perhaps planting wild fruit trees across the Isle of Man would fit with green plants, and kids might be able to benefit from harvesting free fruit. 
you know what? It's not a bad idea, that isn't it? It goes. I've seen that in other places of the world. People doing the gorilla gardening and planting veggies. So why not plant some fruit trees out and about, and uh, people could go and help themselves? Doesn't sound like an entirely bad idea. Gorilla Getting... gardening is a great expression. Gorilla gardening. Love it. Yeah, love it indeed. It's uh, Andy. Actually, Andy Wint is a fan of gorilla gardening. He said he'd volunteer if there's a gorilla gardener group. Okay. Um, <laughs> surely it would make more sense to have private sniffer dogs operating on the ferries, says uh, Alex, during the four-hour journey, they could discreetly search every vehicle on board, then notify authorities so they, anyone obviously breaking the law or bringing in illicit substances could be arrested after docking, or at least uh, they could certainly be questioned. As it stands, the very few vehicles searched can only be inspected in the hour before boarding. I think that's the one where you're going on and you know you get singled out every so often, don't you? You go down a separate channel and they do a quick check. I've been down there before. Mm-hmm. Well, Quite you do look suspicious. Faster, but <laughs> I'm saying nothing. They did find some cheese once, which is a bit suspect. Um, but it just been there for too long. Okay. Um, but yeah, I see where you're coming from on that one. And I don't know the answer to that. It would seem on the face of that, uh, not at all a bad idea. I wonder what quantity of our materials, uh, particularly concrete, have gone into filleting the Everton, filling in the Everton site next door, says G. Uh, a very good question. question. Uh, back to AI. Muriel is saying uh, quite an interesting thought. If a lot of jobs are going to go to AI... What happens to tax? She says, I just a thought, how much tax will be collected from these AI working machines to help run the country? The answer being zero. And I suppose the idea is if there's more and more and more going to AI, does the tax revenue fall? That's a very good point. And one more quickly for you. And um, yes, someone saying, I've just been, I've seen pictures of this uh, new boat coming in. Uh, yes, you were mentioning that a little bit earlier on. I've been told they've got wardrobes in the cabins. Who unpacks for a four-hour <laughs> trip, <laughs> says Tony. Well, you know, there might might be someone. I don't generally, but um, I think Never a while know, back, wasn't you? there, that someone was talking about a lady on the plane who got on the plane for a 20-minute flight and sort of had the eye mask and the sprays and the <laughs> slippers and the sort of the shoulder hole, and it was like a 20-minute flight. But, you know, each to their own, each Tony. To their own. If you really want Absolutely. to unpack everything and then pack it up again as soon as you've got it in the wardrobe. Maybe if you're going to a wedding, you know, you could put yeah, like you a wedding hand gear, up could your, there, yeah. you could put your big hat in there, that yeah, sort of thing, maybe. or little hat. Dave in Onken has been in touch to say the presence of the bishop in Timwald is totally undemocratic. He's not elected by anybody. MLCs are voted by MHKs who are elected by the voters. By voting in an MHK, the public gives them a mandate to elect MLCs on our behalf, but the bishop waltzes in without any reference to the public. The church, says Dave, has absolutely no place to be getting involved with the business of government. If the Church of England has a representative, then shouldn't every other faith, religion or cult have a representative? Gemma says, is the steam packet going to use the Ben McCree for summer services to Holyhead and Stranra in future? Uh, Peter says, texter endings 572, this is Peter Murcott, has a relevant point showing the hypocrisy of some of the members of the House of Keys. They'll vote against being present for prayers. They'll vote against the presence of Bishop in Timwald, but were quite happy for themselves and family members to have pride of place in the chapel at St John's on Timmel Day. I think that was a really interesting point, actually, that Peter Murcott made, that if you do go down the road of removing the role of bishop from the Legislative Council and then Timwald, what then happens to our Timmel Day ceremony? Because surely if that's being revised, then you would have to look at the religious elements of that uh, service. Um, there is a text here from number ending 212. Why is nobody talking about the consultation around the post office getting rid of the mail plane and what it means for Isle of Man businesses? It is already an issue to get supplies and to fulfil orders with the current mail plane. They need a new plane, not no plane at all. Freedom to flourish or freedom to flounder, Our Scott. Things seem to be going backwards. That is an interesting one. Uh, there is that consultation. You can find a link to it on the Manx Radio website. It'd be really interesting to get your thoughts. So, yeah, what happens um, with things? If you, you order things which previously been able to get fairly quickly to the Isle of Man, it would have an impact, presumably. Uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, Terry says, AI isn't a bad thing for me. I'm looking forward. Oh, can I read this? Yeah, go on. Go on. I'm looking forward to having a silicon AI girlfriend. I can't get a real one for love nor money. They'll be better company, good investment. Terry, yeah. I wondered where you were going there. I think we're just bordering on safe. Yeah, probably, probably okay. Or you could, you could just get a cat. Okay. Uh, 12.42 now.
Remember from Dave. Let's go to the lines and join Julian. Good afternoon, Julian. Hi, hey, Beth. Um, yeah, the call that was on, uh, well, the, the person that texted in before about the um, postal uh, flight. Yes. Just looking at, I think it's a beach craft that they use, um, or that's um, on, on some of them, but I think mainly it's the Atlantic Air one, but that looks to be somewhere at least around a million pounds saved if they, because they're saying they're trying to save on cost because it's a reasonably large aircraft. Mm. Um, is that going to mean a reduction in the postal charges from the saving? Because that's going to be quite a big saving because it's going to be something like 363 days of private flight saved, isn't it? Yeah, it's an interesting point, Julian. Certainly one uh, once the consultation, I guess, has come to an end and we, we have a, a firm decision on that, it would be interesting to find out. Would you be impacted personally if we didn't have airmail? Well, it might. I mean, you know, taking into account fog delays, I mean, it could, in theory, make things a bit um, more reliable because the boat, I think, has a better reliability figure in mm-hmm. general over throughout the whole year, although the the, um, the flight does, does tend to seem to get in most days. But um, it makes you wonder if it's uh, if it's a saving, um, where are we going to see the saving? And actually, another point, you mentioned earlier about where we're talking about the cost of the um, ferry terminal at Liverpool. Yeah. And you were saying about risk. <clears throat> but if they're taking a risk with our money and there's no accountability and there's no punishment for getting it wrong... Where do you see the risk lying? It's only with us, but with them taking taking no risk whatsoever, isn't it? Interesting point, Julian. Thank you very much as ever. Lovely to talk to you. Um, if you've got any thoughts on the, the mail situation, it'd be really interesting to talk to you. As I mentioned, that consultation is running currently. H? Indeed. Uh, plenty of text coming in, as is always the case. Uh, Pete says, uh, why do you, H, assume the crossing in the Manxman will only be four hours? Well, I didn't actually, uh, Peter. That was uh, that was Tony, the person who texted in about the wardrobe, suggesting it was four hours. Well, that's that's an average time, is it? Is, are the crossings much longer than that generally? I don't know. I mean, these else? are all questions, aren't they? Um, uh, and there is a lot of speculation. I think it's fair to say that the Steampack has got their blog going, so we're sort of watching the Manxman make its progress. But I think there are questions that the general public direct has. Direct sailings to Madeira, something like oh, that. Oh yes. Shall we know, do that? That'd take be a, a good take one. Take a leaf out of the uh, the airlines book somewhere along the line. Who knows? Uh, but uh, it was the uh, I think Tony. It was Peter who suggested that time, and uh, I wouldn't necessarily disagree with it as a sort of vague average, I suppose. Now or less, now or more. I don't know. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, don't remove the historic and unique position of the Bishop of Sodran Man. Take the vote away. Instead, and this has been suggested, June says, a uh, few people have been suggesting this idea, keep the place but actually remove the vote so he can enter the debate but not actually vote on it if that's what people really want. I don't know, but a few people have suggested that. Regarding the bishop, uh, it says Texter ending 068, it's another attempt to remove our ancient traditions. This is not acceptable. There's certainly an element of truth in that, I suppose, in that a lot of people do like the whole tradition of Timbald. And maybe, whilst, as you say, he's not voted in directly, I think a lot of people think having someone in there with an independent mind, uh, an independent voice, and um, what should we say, high moral values? I just put it out there. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? You would have thought a lot of people might think it's very good. And finally, uh, regarding Timble Dave, July the 5th falls at a weekend. It always moves to the next working day, never earlier, says L. Oh, there's one more here as well. Like, uh, Victoria has got a quirky take on AI. I think artificial intelligence, says Victoria, should be made out of plasticine with free chalk ices in the interval. Thank you, Victoria. I'll have what you're having. OK, I'll have two. Uh, Jeff says, I think, for what it's worth, whether we all agree or not with the capital projects, what we actually want for our money is when they start a job, push it through on time and on budget, but more importantly, finish the job before moving on to something else. Texter ending 653 has been in touch with regard to the bishop. The bishop cannot be independent. He will not look at issues on the basis of fat, but on the basis of his religion. There should be no religion involved in any area of government. JK says AI will just put people out of work. Stop it now. The rich will benefit and nobody else. Uh, Texter ending 014, when the Liverpool Sea Terminal is eventually available, it will only be used two days a week during the winter. This would indicate 100 days a year when it will not be used. Is this good value for money, especially as the minister has no idea of the final cost? 
Now, Richie has been in touch about the bishop and says, I'm not a church-going Christian, but I have always been grateful and impressed by the interactions I've had with the bishop. His kindness, decency and patience are uncommon in today's world. His wise words should always be welcome in our politics. If change should ever have to come, the bishop should perhaps retain their seat, but refrain from voting unless specifically mandated to do so by Timwald on particular issues. I should say at this point as well, we did invite the uh, Lord Bishop Peter Eagles to be interviewed on this, but he doesn't feel the time is right now for him to have any say on this. But I am uh, very confident that he will speak to us in the future. Maxwell says, if the proposed idea to get rid of 1p, 2p and 5p coins went ahead, this would mean any proposed increase in the price of food items would increase by 10 pence. Uh, Thanks very much indeed, Maxwell. H, I was thinking about this and you know one of the the lovely things that happens is when you find a penny on the floor it's lucky isn't it when you find a penny on the floor if we don't have one peas and two peas that's not going to happen yeah pick up a penny you'll be a penny richer all day that's not the saying is it what is it see a penny pick it up all day long you have good luck and then you give it to someone else and they have luck too i think there's something yeah, like that I but just, i just think i'm vaguely wealthier for nothing really <laughs> Okay. Uh, The member behind the motion to remove the bishop has a party conference this weekend. Jane wonders if that is a coincidence. If there's no place for religion in politics, does that mean all MHKs must be atheist? asks Tony C. Um, Has the Isle of of Man post, asks Fran, thought of investing in a flock of carrier pigeons? (laughs) Well, you know, uh, stranger things have happened and uh, clearly they have been used. In times of war and other times of times of yore and war, they've been used with a reasonable amount of effect, and I suppose they're fairly green, and and you get free uh, fertilizer. Uh, Thomas says, I honestly think scrap the boat and the ferry terminal and build a bridge. Probably end up being cheaper and would have been built on time and on budget. In fact, we had someone last week uh, suggesting to Andy that yes, a tunnel was the other idea. I, you know what? It's again, is it possible? Well, clearly it is because we have massive bridges and we've got the Channel Tunnel. I don't know. I think a tunnel between here and the Alaman, um, would I be right in saying it'd be longer than the Channel Tunnel? It would be a long old tunnel. And I'm thinking, what are we talking, 30 billion, 50 billion more? Well, with our track record, maybe 75 billion. Uh, and you think, yes, how long would it take to get that back? Can you lend them a fiver? Yeah. OK. Um, I have no problem, says Texter ending 610 with the advent of artificial intelligence. I'm a plumber by trade and I'd like to see it unblock a toilet or bleed a radiator. <laughs> well, I think you're safe there. I mean, it's the end of the day. I remember reading an article once saying that exactly things like that. A plumber at hairdressers again. It's going to be quite some time before an AI type machine. You can go in and say, oh, yeah, just my usual, please. Bit off the back and trim at the sides there. Oh, yes, certainly, sir. Off we go. What are you doing at the weekend? Going to be ages before we get there. It is interesting, though, this notion of AI. And we are seeing it in more shops and seeing it over here in the Isle of Man, you know, the self-service tills. Um, And I do remember a few weeks ago when I was doing Man and Line, somebody talking about how it is changing the face of shopping, really, not having that interaction, however brief it might be, with somebody who's swiping your shopping through. Yeah, and I think for a lot of people, it's getting back to the post office debate, and mm. we've had on the man in line a lot of time. It's it's not just necessarily the direct service itself. Clearly, that's the most important thing. It's also that human contact, whether it's banking, whether it's post office, whether it's buying your goods, or whatever the case may be. There's definite a feeling of that human contact is is very satisfying. You have that feeling of you're not alone. For a lot of people who are living on their own, elderly people and such like, it might be the only person you see. And I guess the whole thing of actually going out and the same way that shopping is is a chore on one hand you have to shop to buy things to eat or whatever but also as we know for a lot of people it's a hobby so you know it, it's if you took it all away it was all just online and all ai would it be as enjoyable i suspect not Paul Q has been in touch to say, I'm an eBay business seller and to qualify for discount, I have to offer a next day delivery option to buyers. If the new changes do happen, we will lose the next day special delivery service. So I lose my discount. Uh, Interesting point there. Robert wants to know why the Isle of Man is not Scottish friendly, says always difficult and expensive to get to the island. Looking at the humanity of recent behaviours in government, says G, it would seem AI has already been replaced, uh, uh, replacing people in Timwald. 
Um, some David saying with regard to Julian's comments about the one million pound saving that he believed there was going to be uh, if we do scrap the airplane uh, that carries the mail. There won't be a big saving as the mail that comes on the plane will then come at the ferry at a cost. Um, and an interesting one from Tina. Um, I'm going to look into this one, Tina. Um, and uh, just see if I can get any clarity on that one. So regard to the Manxman, let's see if I can get any clarity on that one before we talk about that. Uh, Robbie says, it's not just the scooters that are a problem on our roads and pavements, but also skateboards. And I don't just mean kids, but adults who are the worst. Um, and he also says, I was going to tell you a joke about boxing, but I forgot the punchline. I ordered a chicken and an egg on Amazon. I'll let you know. Thank you very much forgot indeed, Robbie. Oh. No, that wasn't the joke. Oh, Even I, I got the joke there. Oh, right, Did you right. not get it? No, go on. It's about what comes first, isn't it? What, the punch The on chicken it? or the egg. Oh, right, yeah. Okay, that was very good. Well, it was until you ruined it. Uh, that is just about all for today. Thank you so, so much as ever for your company and your contributions. Um, there are some texts I haven't got round to reading and we haven't had time to get to both on email here and on WhatsApp. So I will go through all of those and pass those on to Andy. And if there's an answer that we need to get to something, we will endeavour to do that. Andy is going to be back at midday on Monday. And as I said earlier, he will be joined live in the studio by the Deaf Minister Claire Barber and also the Interim Chief Executive or Chief Operating Officer Steve Stanley. So if you've got any questions that you'd like to get in ahead of time, 682631 is the number to call. You can leave a message. It can be played out on the show. Coming up next, it is Chris Quirk with 1 to 3. Whatever you are doing over the next couple of days, have a great weekend and I'll talk to you again soon. Thank you very much as ever to Howard Kane for producing today's programme.